I'm here at Microsoft Build, where more than 6,000 people are attending what is the company's biggest event of the year. Now, Microsoft, the past few years, has been on somewhat of a roll. Since 2014, when Satya Nadella took over as CEO, the company's stock has nearly tripled. Many attribute that to investments in cloud, software services like Office 365, and its investment in artificial intelligence. Now, I sat down with the corporate vice president of artificial intelligence and research, Lily Cheng. I began by asking her why she thought it was important to gain the public's trust with respect to artificial intelligence. So much of your life deals with software and your phone, your computer, that if you don't trust the thing that you live in and use for five hours a day or that you're checking you know, every hour or every five minutes or kids are sleeping next to it sometimes on their pillow, then um, it isn't designed properly. So I think we really need to up the game in how we trust software. And I think as it becomes more and more intelligent, um, we just need to make sure that we're building that in from the ground up. But I think especially with the European Union and um, just a lot of what's gone on, I think... Um, Facebook uh, privacy issues. Right, so privacy issues like that, I think everybody, everyone in the software industry is thinking about it and not, you know, and, and just people in the general public are thinking about this and they're really demanding that they have more knowledge of how their data is used and shared. You work with artificial intelligence bots. First, tell us what a bot exactly is. Sure, so a bot, um, we should just think that everything you say to your phone or your computer or anything you type deals with language. And in general, software over time, we think everything you say and type, we will do more with what you input into the system. So for example, if you say, hey, meet me tomorrow um, by the park near my house, the system might actually pull up a calendar card and do that for you rather than you having to um, switch apps and do things. So um, bots are software that software app that understands language and conversation um, kind of, and it's kind of built in. What level are bots currently operating at? I still see a lot of bots where do you want to talk to a human and I think people would still rather push I want to talk to a human on chat as opposed to a bot. I think it depends on what what you're doing and so obviously we have you know a great future ahead of us to ever match um, the intelligence of a person in dialogue and conversation. And you know, obviously some of the most sophisticated um, bots out there today are things like Xiao Ice, which we launched in China, or Cortana, Alexa, you know, lots of these um, systems. And they, they don't have human-like voice conversations with you yet. But I think there's such so much improvement that we can do over the kinds of interaction that you have today. So think of the touch-tone phone where you're trying to navigate through a menu for help in a lot of companies. I mean, that's, that's just ripe for completely being disrupted and changed and being made better. On stage, we saw Microsoft's Cortana opening up Amazon's Alexa and vice versa. Is this a breakthrough? You know, Cortana and Alexa is just sort of one example of two really um, high quality assistants being able to interact together versus a user having to say, well, I have to choose. You know, I have to pick either this browser or that browser and they can't inter interoperate. And so one of the things I think, I worked in social software, and one of our dreams, I think, was that uh, social software would be much more ubiquitous and um, open form of communication than something like email, where I needed to know your email address. But in one sense, email is so much more open because I don't care what email client software you use, I can email you. Social media, you actually have to be in my social network in order to communicate with me. And I think with bots and assistants, our goal is that they really interoperate and it's, it's just a smooth experience for somebody using it where you don't have to think so much about does this person have the same thing I have in order for me to communicate with them or do business with them. We saw on stage where there was a, a boardroom meeting where uh, things were being translated, conversation identified. Uh, how much of an advancement is that technology? I think both in real-time translation, where we have some of the most advanced AI um, translating what you say you know, in real time, as well as just the ability to do um, kind of human parody with speech is, is really groundbreaking and amazing. Five years ago, I think we would have said, you know, that's really improbable that we're gonna have human parody around speech or that we would be able to have you author something in one language and translate it in real time to, you know, so many languages and have that be so accessible for people. So it's something that we're really proud of. And I think it's really key because, like I said before, 
if you can't speak the language that I speak, <laughs> then it's not useful for me. So it's really important for us to make sure as we're doing conversational AI that we reach people in their own language um, and that we actually enable people to speak together even if you speak different languages. It's kind of a, an, a magical thing. Like my family, my dad's Chinese, my mom's Japanese, my husband's half French and half Israeli. And it's actually hard for me to speak to all my relatives, <laughs> you know? And if we can use technologies just to help people communicate better, I mean, that's, that's a huge advancement. I also asked Chang about whether artificial intelligence would impact jobs, and she said undoubtedly in the future it will as more jobs become automated. But she stressed the importance of the proper education in training the next generation for the jobs of the future. Mark New, CGTN, Seattle.